Well, hey, all of you sheepies near and far, welcome to worship whenever you have a chance to watch this video. I'm recording on Saturday and it is beautiful outside and it sounds like we are supposed to get some snowy weather coming. So enjoy today and part of Sunday before our wintry weather. The robins have to have their tails snowed on at least three times or so the legend goes. Anyway, be careful out there. Today is the 13th of March. Uh, typically, a snowstorm period in March and time change as well. Let me pray us in. Gracious Lord, there is nowhere we can escape from your presence. Give us eyes to see those in need around us. Give us the voice to sing your salvation song. When we are in need, send your servants alongside of us and help us to be those servants too. All of this we pray in your most holy name. Amen. Well, we are in Luke's Gospel, chapter 16 today, verses 19 through 31. Luke 16, 19 through 31. This is the parable of the rich man and Lazarus. A little humor to start us off because we've got kind of a deep, deep topic today. This 85-year-old couple died on the same day after having been married almost 60 years they had been in good health the last 10 years, mainly due to their interest in health, food, and exercise. When they reached the pearly gates, St. Peter took them to their mansion, which was decked out with a beautiful kitchen, a master bath suite with a jacuzzi. As they oohed and odd, the old man asked Peter, how much is all of this going to cost? It's free said Peter, this is heaven. Next, they went out back to survey the championship golf course in the backyard of their heavenly home. They would have golfing privileges every day, and each week the course changed to a new one, representing all the great golf courses on the earth. The old man asked, what are the green fees? Peter says, this is heaven. You play for free. Next, they went to the clubhouse and they saw this lavish buffet lunch with all the cuisines of the world laid out. How much to eat, said the old man. Don't you understand yet, says Peter. This is heaven. It's all free. Well, where are the low fat and low cholesterol tables, the old man asked timidly. Peter lectured, <laughs> well, that's the best part. You can eat as much as you like, whatever you like, and you're never going to get, gain any weight, and you're never going to get sick. This is heaven. With that, the old man went into a fit of anger, throwing down his hat and stomping on it and shrieking wildly. Peter and his wife tried to calm him down and and. He said, well, what, what's wrong, Peter said. The old man looks at his wife and he says, this is all your fault. If it weren't for your blasted bran muffins and health food, I would have been here 10 years ago. <laughs> so what absorbs your time, your attention, and your heart? In today's story, a parable that is only found in the Gospel of Luke, we see Jesus painting some pretty drastic contrasts. Rich versus poor, compassion versus non-compassion, earthly treasure versus heavenly ones, and heaven versus hell. We see a reversal of fortune. Jesus often uses parables to illustrate a point in order to make a point of spiritual truth. Luke's gospel, as we have seen, is full of them. 
Jesus was teaching the disciples, but mainly he's pointing fingers at the Pharisees. This parable of the rich man and Lazarus is indeed a tough one, one that might make us squirm a little bit, perhaps, because we church folks love to talk about and reflect on heaven, but what about hell? This makes us a little more uncomfortable, huh? Martin Luther called this text a parable of conscience, a parable of conscience. As pastor, I get asked the question often, what about hell? Do I believe that hell is an actual place, this eternal lake of fire that the Apostle John's revelation describes? Or do I believe that hell is an absence of the presence and grace of God? I believe that hell is both. I believe that hell is both a physical place and an absence of the presence and grace of God. If we believe that heaven is an actual place, that our loved ones have gone to, to heaven, then we also have to believe that hell is an actual place. I hope that you know that I am always careful about how I answer questions such as this. And I also hope you know that I understand that I do not hold the inside scoop on all of the things of God, just because I'm PL, Pastor Lori. You've heard me say time and time again that God is God and I am not many times over, good for us to remember, even we pastor folk. I've had this conversation recently about hell, specifically a couple weeks ago with our confirmation students, as I referenced last week, the, the Apostles' Creed makes reference to Jesus descending into hell, descending into hell. As we consider Good Friday and then resurrection morning of Easter, so our story for today is quite timely, I think. And I'm going to try not to get too heady with it, but also hopefully help us sort some of this out because it is indeed a deep passage, but good for us to think on. I first want to look at the text one that is sometimes avoided, by the way, just because the church does not want to go there, which makes me sad. You will note that we went there with our young people in confirmation, using the word hell and heaven and, and angels. We do not do our young people or anybody any good by sugarcoating it. We can use our best judgment, but if we expect our kids to recite the Apostles' Creed so Grandma can feel proud on Confirmation Day, then we better be able to explain hell and why Jesus went there in the first place. In our text for today, we have two men, a rich man who was, well, rich, as in the material sense, he wore fine clothes. Purple cloth was expensive, and it also signified wealth. It also signifies royalty, usually, when we see purple, especially in, in Scripture. He feasted every day, probably on Angus beef. At any rate, this rich man was not a lack for anything, except a name. He is not named. We don't know his name, although some older translations of scripture refer to him as dives, D-I-V-E-S, dives, which basically means rich man, rich man. Then we have this other character in our story, a poor man who is named. Lazarus. But it's not the same Lazarus that was raised from the dead, not Mary and Martha's brother Lazarus. It's important to note the difference. There's only two Lazaruses in scripture, and this is one of them. 
The other one is the Bethany Lazarus, Mary Martha's brother that was, you know, dead for four days. This is a different Lazarus, okay? Both Lazarus, both of our scripture Lazaruses are indeed saints in the Catholic Church. This one is San Lazaro, San Lazaro. The poor man, Lazarus, laid at the rich man's gate every day. He had open oozing sores that the wild dogs came and licked. Ew. Ew, right? Lazarus longed for the scraps from the rich man's table, and the wild dogs probably got those first two. So we have this contrast, wealth versus poverty, haves versus have-nots. So hmm, we push the pause button again of our lives, and we take an inside glimpse. As we ponder our own state, if we ate today, or even if we missed breakfast, but we had supper last night, and we can't wait for that first cup of coffee in the morning, and it's, we know it's going to be there, we're in the haves section, friends. We have. You've heard it said that he who dies with the most toys wins. You've also heard it said that he who dies with the most toys still dies. So then what? Scripture tells us in red letter Jesus words that the poor man is carried by angels to Abraham's side. Older translations read Abraham's bosom. That's where we get rockin' my soul in the bosom of Abraham, rockin' my soul in the bosom of Abraham, rockin' my soul in the bosom of Abraham, oh, rockin' my soul. Elvis sings it much better than I do. So the rich man dies, and he is buried, and his soul went to the place of the dead, in Greek meaning Hades hell. There in torment, he saw Abraham. Father Abraham has many sons, Father Abraham. He's off in the distance. Lazarus has died too. They both die. Lazarus and the rich man both die. And so the rich man sees Father Abraham, and, and he's got Lazarus by, by his side, and the rich man shouts, Father Abraham, have pity on me. Send Lazarus on over here. Send him on over here to, to dip his finger in the cool water to just touch my tongue. Just touch my tongue with some, some cool water. It's, it, it, it's blistering. I'm in anguish over here in the flames. Two things to note here. The rich man knows Lazarus' name now, doesn't he? The rich man is still looking at Lazarus as a servant to him. Send Lazarus on over here to cool my tongue. <laughs> See how the rich man is still bossing Lazarus around, looking down? From a not-so-comfortable place, he's still looking down on Lazarus. Probably looking up, but looking down as far as status-wise. So Abraham replies to the rich man, <clears throat> Son, remember that in your lifetime, you had everything that you wanted, while Lazarus had nothing. And so now he is here being comforted while you are in anguish. Besides, there is this great chasm separating the two, and no one can cross from here to there. There is a separation. The rich man pleads again, and then please just, just send someone to go and talk to my brothers so they don't end up in torment too. But Abraham says, no. 
Father Abraham flat out says no. Moses and the other prophets have already warned them. Your brothers didn't listen very good in Sunday school to Moses and the prophets. They didn't listen up in, in the synagogue. For the third time, the rich man pleads, but Father Abraham, if only you send someone to them from the dead, then they will believe and repent. And Abraham's response is a prophetic one as Jesus is heading to the cross taking the sins of the world upon himself. Hear these words. If they won't listen to Moses and the other prophets, they won't be persuaded, even if someone rises from the dead. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones God's messengers, how often have I wanted to gather you in as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you wouldn't let me. We had that verse a couple weeks ago, didn't we? And then the scene closes and the curtain falls and Lazarus is in heaven and the rich man is in hell. And as Jesus continues to make his way to Jerusalem and to the cross, he is going to continue to preach and teach about the kingdom now and the one to come. And how our love of money and power plays into that. We need to always keep in mind the context in which our text was written. Here, Jesus is on his way to the cross. Fact. It is no secret that his relationship with the religious leaders is a turbulent one. Things continue to, to heat up. And who especially wanted Jesus gone? Caiaphas, the high priest. Scholars believe that Jesus is specifically calling out Caiaphas here in, in this parable he would have been listening or he would have gotten wind of it anyway. Caiaphas was wealthy. He was dressed in purple linen because of his status as a high priest. Purple is the color for wealth and royalty and Caiaphas had five brothers. And of course he knew about Moses and the prophets and yet he was blind to salvation right on his doorstep, literally, in and through Jesus Christ, the Messiah. He was also blind to those around him that were hurting. There were plenty of Lazaruses within his sight, and he did nothing. He did nothing to help them. Jesus is not saying that money is a bad thing. We need money to live. He knows that. But what he is saying is that our finances become a faith document of sorts of our life. Where are we spending our money? God cares more about the 90% that we don't spend on church than the 10% that we do if we are tithers we give 10% of our income back to God. That comes out of our paycheck first, by the way, not last, or of it if we have it uh, left over. I read a quote this week while researching for today because I think you know that I like to live generously. However, I will admit that I wrestle with giving when it appears to be a perpetual cycle that creates dependency rather than empowerment. The quote read, give a gift with dignity, not dependence. Empower rather than create dependence. This is the role of the church. I'm gonna read that again. Give a gift with dignity, not dependence. Empower rather than create dependence. 
This is the role of the church. One of my favorite Jesus stories is of the lame beggar whose friends carry him every day to the pool of Siloam. Shalom. Siloam. I think it's pool of Siloam. And he lays there and he begs. He, he's dependent upon them to carry him to and, and fro because it, it's in the heart of the city and he knows there's going to be traffic there. When Jesus finally comes along and asks the man, do you finally want to be made well or, or not? And if you do, then get up and walk. Such a fine line between empowerment versus dependence. And we have to prayerfully discern between the two and leave the rest in God's hands. As we look at heaven versus hell, I want to be theologically correct, or at least denominationally and true to our Wesleyan heritage. What is our United Methodist stance on hell, to which I found to be a, a bit wishy-washy, to be perfectly honest? First, let me say, because I know that we have many in our midst with a Catholic background, both uh, in-person worship and viewing online, we as United Methodists and Protestants in general reject the idea of purgatory. This place where souls of the faithful and dead endure a period of purification and cleansing, aided by the prayers of the living to help them get to heaven. You can believe what you want, but this is the official stance of the Protestant church, meaning non-Catholic. Now, in the Protestant Church, including the United Methodist Church, there are differing viewpoints of what happens after we die. Some believe that there is this period of big sleep, that the dead remain asleep until the final judgment day. However, Jesus himself said to the good thief on the cross, I, I always love this, this story and I'm pretty sure we only find it in Luke, is the conversation between Jesus and the two thieves on the cross. Remember that? He says to the good thief on the cross, the one who identified him as the Christ, today you will be with me in paradise, which gives us indication of the immediate transition into a heavenly, our heavenly home. I just referenced this passage with our confirmation students, too, as we were talking about this. I choose to believe the latter, the immediate transition into our heavenly home after we die, if we confess Jesus as our Lord and Savior. One, because of this passage, because of this response to the good thief, he's called, and because of personal experience with those who have transitioned from this life to a heavenly one. I, I've seen evidence of it. I do so believe. Well, then how about hell? How about hell? Physical place? Absence of the love and grace of God? I believe both. As far as our United Methodist stance on that, we are relatively silent about what happens between death and final judgment when Jesus comes back again. But here's what we do know. As one of our confirmants says, well, how do you know? Well, I don't know for sure, but we have this book, the, the scripture that helps us to, to know, to assume. Hebrews 11 says, now, faith is the assurance of the things hoped for, the conviction of things unseen. In Romans 8, 38 and 39, you, you know this one. And I am convinced that nothing can separate us from God's love, neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither our fears for today or our worries for tomorrow, not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above or the earth below, indeed nothing in all creation 
will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Jesus Christ, our Lord. The love of God revealed how? In and through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Here's what I don't know for sure, and neither do you, so we don't get to claim. How's that for being direct? We don't have the inside track on the mysteries of God. And that includes the absolute for sure of what heaven and hell will look like and who goes where. We don't get to play judge. We don't get to play judge, so we need to be very careful. But here is what I do know for sure, because scripture tells me and you again and again, there is no place that God's love does not extend, friends. There is no part of our human existence that Christ's love does not reach, including descending into hell for us. He descended into hell. Jesus went to hell and back to save us. I love him. I love that phrase because he did. Jesus went to hell and back to save us. Psalm 139, one of my favorites, you know that. O oh Lord, you have examined my heart. You know everything about me. You know when I sit down or stand up. You know my thoughts even when I am far away. You see me when I travel and rest at home. If I go up to heaven, you are there. And if I go down to the grave, you are there. Our Catholic friends use this parable as a final commendation, a farewell to the dead. It is called in paradisium, in paradise. Pastor Steve Quist use, uses this often. I, I remember that from him. Are you ready? May the angels lead you into paradise. May the martyrs welcome your arrival and take you into the heavy, heavenly city of Jerusalem. May the chorus of angels receive you and with Lazarus, who is now no longer a poor man, may you find eternal rest. I find that to be very beautiful. If we were to think of ourselves as this choir of earthly angels acting as this bridge between this life and a heavenly one, would it perhaps change how we live in this life? We are this heavenly chorus on this side of heaven. Would we not want friends on this side of heaven singing us into heaven? as well as being received into heaven by friends who have already gone before us, singing us home. We have a responsibility to be citizens of heaven on this side of heaven. Ones who come alongside each other, bridging this chasm rather than widening it even more. So let us sing Salvation Song on this side in preparation for the next. Let us pray. Oh, thank you, God, for knowing us so intricately. You created us by your hand and know everything about us. You long to be in relationship with us even when we push away your love. Remain steadfast. So much so that you go to the depths to reach us. And so we pray that you would forgive us, restore us, help us walk in faithful steps all of the days of our lives until we see your face. In your holy name we pray. And all God's beautiful people say, Amen. Thanks for joining us for worship today. Have a good week. Be careful out there with the weather. Bye for now.